Well, welcome to St. Paul United Methodist Church. Thank you so much for joining us for this time of worship. Uh, we are glad that we can gather together to sing God's praises and to cry out to Him. Uh, whether you're able to be here in person or worshiping with us in the parking lot or uh, online, we're glad that we can gather together. And so as we begin this time of worship, uh, let's quiet our hearts before God in prayer. So let's pray. Almighty God, we gather together today, coming by faith, entering into your presence. And so we humbly ask that your spirit will minister to us today so that all that we do will honor and glorify you. We dedicate this time to you in the name of the Lord and the Savior Jesus. Amen. Well, for those of you in person, I invite you to stand as you're able and let's lift our hearts and our spirits, praising and worshiping God. Why are you trying to earn 
You may be seated. And welcome once again to St. Paul. Uh, my name is Clifton Vaughn. I'm the pastor of the congregation. And it's truly a joy when we can come together to worship God. And so thank you very much for joining us, whether you're able to be here in person or possibly worshiping with us online. Uh, we are so glad that you have chosen to worship with us today. And please know you're welcome to come back each and every Sunday to become a full part of this congregation. Uh, for those of you who are worshiping online, there's an attendance link. And so I invite you to click on that to let us know that you're worshiping with us. Uh, for those of you in person, there's a QR code in your bulletin and you're invited to use that using your phone device and then clicking on that link. That enables us to know you are here. It also enables you to share any prayer concerns or any questions that you may have so that we can in turn reach out and encourage you on your journey of faith. Uh, but I am glad that you are here and please know you're welcome to come back and be a part of us. As we continue in our worship, we gather for the time for the children. And so, children, I invite you to come on down and join me on the stairs. Good morning, boys and girls. I was about to say, now, now y'all are not quite awake yet. Good morning. Good morning. Yay. Okay. Hey, does anybody know what these are? Uno, Uno cards. That's right. Okay, so we're going to play just a, uh, not a real game of Uno, but we're just going to play a rough game of Uno, okay? So there's your cards. Hold on to those. All right. And these are going to be my cards. All right. So does everybody know how to play Uno? Everybody know? Everybody know? Everybody know? So basically, we're going to turn over a card. And so now, somebody, Emma's got to play either a red card or a yellow card. What are you going to do? Oh, that's right. So because the three went on the three. So what do I have to play? What do I have to play? Yeah, so I either have to play a yellow or a three. Okay, so why don't I play that one? Well, why would that not work? No, oh, we, we can ignore that rule. That's fine. Okay, so what do you want to play? That one? Okay, so this one means that I have to draw four. Is that right? Yeah, is that what I usually have to do, draw four? Yeah, I don't want to do that, so I'm not going to do that. Um, hey, what color, do you, what color do you want? You want red? Okay, um, I'm going to play this one then, okay? Is, is that okay? Why not? Because it's not red, yeah. Okay, so are games fun when you don't play the rules? Why, why, are, why are they no fun if you don't play the rules? That's right, because there's no winner and there's no loser. And really, you can't have a whole lot of fun if you don't play some of the rules, aren't you? Well, in our Christian life, did you know that we are to help one another uh, in our relationship with God and part of that is to really help one another do what God wants so that we can enjoy the life that he's given us and that's to enjoy it to the best ability that there is and so throughout this week I encourage you not only to pray for one another but to encourage each other to really help each other on their relationship with God. So maybe that means helping somebody to read the Bible or maybe inviting your parents to read the Bible to you or praying together as a family or, or maybe serving, maybe helping your brother or your sister in a good way. Sound good? Okay. Let's pray together and let's do an echo prayer and so you can repeat after me and any slightly uh, older larger children are welcome to join with us or any online as well. So let's put our hands together and repeat after me. Dear God, dear God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for knowing what's best. Thank you for knowing what's best. Help me, help me to be faithful to you, to be faithful to you. In the name of Jesus, name of Jesus, amen. Okay, kids, you may go off to Children's Church with Mrs. Amy or back to your seats with whomever brought you. 
And as they go off to Children's Church, I invite our ushers to come forward as we continue in the worship of God. Yes, I'm sorry, children. You're going to be going out that direction today. Sorry about that, kids. All right. We're going to continue in the worship of God through our giving. Uh, Part of what we do here as a church is not only reach out to our children, but also to our youth and helping them to know Jesus and also helping them to serve the Lord. Uh, Leaving today at noon, we have a group of junior high girls that are going to go serve the Lord here in Arkansas at the Ozark Mission Project. And this is made possible uh, not only by the generosity of your gifts, but it's made possible by the spirit of the living God. And so thank you for that. And let's continue in our worship and let's pray together. Dear God, we thank you for all that you are doing. And we pray that you'll bless our worship, bless our gifts, and use them so that more people, young and old, will come to know you and trust you. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Let's join together in singing our song of preparation. It's number 413 in your hymnals, which are located in the pockets in front of you, or the words are on the screen. So let's join together in singing, A Charge to Keep I Have. may be seated. Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers and sisters with me, to the churches in Galatia, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom the glory forever and ever. Amen. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to prevent the gospel of Christ. I'm sorry, are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, should preach a gospel other than the one we preached to you, let them be under God's curse. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you have accepted, let them be under God's curse. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Sandy, thank you very much for helping to lead worship today. I do appreciate you doing so. Uh, for those of you who are worshiping in person, in the center part of your bulletins uh, is a sermon insert. And so I invite you to take it out at this time. If you're worshiping with us online via Facebook, there should be an image of this as well in the uh, Facebook feed, and so you're invited to pull up that image as it should help you during today's service. Uh, we are in the midst of a brief sermon series that's dealing with this time of discernment for us as a congregation on whether we are going to uh, end our relationship with the United Methodist Church or whether we're going to continue our connectional relationship with the United Methodist Church. Last week, we dealt with one of the main issues, and that 
message dealt with homosexuality and our call to love. And so if you've not had the opportunity to watch that message or to listen to it, I do encourage you to do so. We did keep all of the sermon inserts that were left over from last week, and they're outside the church office. And again, an image of it has been posted on the church's Facebook page. And so if you have not received that, I do invite you to pick up a copy of the sermon insert and then take the time to listen to it. Uh, there are many different issues for us to discern and to discuss during this season of where we're trying to decide, do we want to stay connected to this denomination or would we like to end our connection with this denomination? So last week we dealt with one of the main issues and then today we're going to deal with another uh, main issue and it's the issue of accountability. Will we hold one another accountable? Now, for some of you, when I even just say that word about accountable and accountability, it begins to make you feel a little bit uncomfortable because as Americans in particular, we're very individualistic. So we like to say, well, you have to come to faith in Jesus for yourself. That's a personal decision. And it is something that you have to decide for yourself to make. But when you decide to follow Jesus, it puts you in the family of God. You become part of the body of Christ. And so as brothers and sisters, we are to hold one another accountable and encourage each other on their journey of faith. In fact, that's one of my main roles as a pastor of the church. It's that symbolic uh, position of being the shepherd of the congregation to help you on your journey of faith to watch over and protect and to point out things in our society or at times even in denominations that lead people astray from following God. That's part of being accountable to one another. And so as we begin just our discussion today, the question for you to wrestle with, to, to ponder over, is will you be held accountable to one another? Will you be held accountable to one another? Let's pray, and then we'll go on into our message for today. Dear God, thank you so much. Uh, we thank you for giving us this time where we can gather together and open up your word and study. And so, Father, speak truth to us. Speak truth to the depths of who we are. We pray all of this. In the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Okay, so in Jesus, the body of Christ, there's one church. Uh, we are united together as one church under the lordship of Jesus Christ. That means that there's one church, whether you are uh, Church of God, whether you are Lutheran, whether you are Baptist, whether you're Roman Catholic or Orthodox, or in our case, United Methodists. We are one church, but yet there are many different denominations because we end up agreeing about different things. And so we end up joining together with like-minded followers of Jesus Christ and joining together and saying, yes, this is what I believe, and you believe like-minded, and so let's join together. And just as a reference, worldwide, there's over 300 Methodist denominations. Just kind of get your head around that. 300 Methodist-related denominations. That's because we have split at different times. We've divided over different things. We've united together over different things because we want to say, this is how I believe. This is how I want to serve and follow our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, as United Methodists, we've had a very interesting history. We began in the United Kingdom in England, and eventually it came to the States. And in America, we developed different paths. And so what used to be known as the Methodist Episcopal Church then split in the two and then came back together and then 
became the Methodist Church, and then the Methodist Church united with a whole different branch that when we came together was called the Evangelical United Brethren Church, but that was really three denominations that ended up in one. And then in 1968, those denominations and the Methodist Church joined together to form the United Methodist Church. Now, we came together believing certain things, and we had certain beliefs that we had, as well as rules that we said that we will follow. Uh, what the rule book is, and we talked some about this last week, is this book that's published every four years after General Conference. It's called the Book of Discipline of the United Methodist Church. It lays out for United Methodists, and especially United Methodist pastors, what we believe, but also how the church is to be structured. Uh, it is basically our agreed upon rules, and so we are to be held accountable to those rules. Let me just remind you of a few of the United Methodist stance. Okay, so you have here qualifications for ordination. Uh, you can read that on your own, but let me just read the underlined phrase. It says, therefore, self-avowed practicing homosexuals are not to be certified as candidates, ordained as ministers, or appointed to serve in the United Methodist Church. And so that's something that we do not do in the United Methodist Church. And then we have two more sections that I've copied for you. One is the unauthorized conduct. Ceremonies that celebrate homosexual unions shall not be conducted by our ministers and shall not be conducted in our churches. In fact, for ordained ministers, we have a list of chargeable offenses, things that we can be punished for, and one of these, let me just mention to you again, immorality, including but not limited to not being celibate in singleness or not being faithful in a heterosexual marriage, and then also being a self-avowed practicing homosexual or conducting ceremonies which celebrate homosexual unions or performing same-sex wedding ceremonies. And so it's clear in our agreed upon set of rules, not only what we believe, but how we are to structure the church and how people who are called to be ministers are to act. Well, their denomination keeps on arguing and discussing this and debating it and arguing and discussing. And finally, in 2016, the argument got so volatile and so acrimonious that basically the delegates at General Conference said to the bishops, bishops, handle this. <laughs> Do something about it. And so they formed a commission that reported in 2019. In the meantime, in 2016, the western jurisdiction of our church said, it's enough's enough. We don't agree with the book of discipline. And instead of doing what is ethical, Remember what I mentioned last week, ethically, if you disagree, then you work within the system to change it, or ethically, you set aside and say, well, I can live with that, or ethically, you leave and find a different denomination, okay? The Western jurisdiction said, well, we disagree with the stance, and we're going to move forward anyway, and so in 2016, they consecrated an openly practicing homosexual to be there, one of the bishops. And so Bishop Karen Oliveto was consecrated as a bishop. What we saw was the argument continued in the United Methodist Church. And in 2019, there was a special called uh, general conference that was supposed to settle the issue. And what ended up happening was what was termed the traditional plan uh, was adopted. And what it did was it continued to do what we have always done since 1972, was affirm the language and supported that tr traditional understanding of the scriptures that the practice of homosexuality is against Christian teaching. And ministers who are self-avowed practicing should not be ordained as ministers. What we saw right after that general conference met in 2019 was then, I don't know how else to phrase it, but basically a schism began to deeply divide 
uh, the American United Methodist Church. And so bishops in wide variety of places in the U.S. Uh, decried the outcome of the 2019 General Conference and said, enough is enough, we're going to move forward and go against the Book of Discipline. And so more and more bishops encouraged their pastors to perform homosexual blessings, homosexual weddings, and then also they continued and well began to ordain openly practicing homosexuals as ministers, even though it went against the book of discipline, went against our agreed upon rules, they moved forward in breaking that. Now what we've seen in the last year or so has all of this conversation uh, is increasing and it's getting closer to home. Uh, let me just mention a few things that have happened. Uh, just this past month in June, uh, the Florida bishop, Bishop Ken Carter, uh, he and the Board of Ordained Ministry put forward for consecration into full-time ministry uh, two or three individuals who are openly practicing homosexuals. Uh, this goes completely against what the bishop had committed to do against our book of discipline, against these, these chargeable offenses here, and yet he went ahead and, and proposed for them for the Florida conference. And now, fortunately, it was voted against by the vast majority of the other pastors who were there, and so it wasn't done. And what we've also seen in Dallas, Texas, in this last month or so was the bishop over that area uh, had received a request for two uh, local pastors who are openly practicing homosexuals to be appointed to churches. And the bishop followed the book of discipline and said, no, we're not to do that. And so a local church in Dallas hired those two pastors and consecrated them themselves in a public way to say that, yes, these are ministers of our church and they will serve. Or if you want to get even closer to home in the last month, We've had an Arkansas clergy woman who officiated a lesbian wedding. All of this is done publicly. All of this is done out in the open. Now, we're yet to see what our bishop will do. Our, our bishop has been very clear that he is a person of integrity, that he will act ethically in following our book of discipline. We'll wait and see what happens. Why does this matter? Why does this matter for us here at St. Paul and Searcy, Arkansas? Well, let me just walk you through a, th a few things that came to mind for me. Uh, one is that a covenant has been broken. A covenant has been broken. A covenant is basically a promise that has been made that we have agreed upon to follow these rules. We have agreed upon that this is what we believe and here is how we are to structure our church. Here is how we are to follow what we are supposed to do as Christians and especially as leaders in the church. And yet that covenant has been broken it's like that Uno game that I played with the children. It's like, how do you work together when you're no longer following any of the agreed-upon rules? Or another example that kept on coming to my mind this past week is like a baseball game. You have the ump who's standing behind the plate, and, and the ump is calling a ball, whether it's a strike or a ball. But what do you do when the ump's not saying anything? Or what do you do when the ump is saying, ah, that's a ball. Well, no, that's a ball. Ah, that's a ball, and, and the game goes on. God wants what is best for us. God wants what is best for you. And to know truly what is best, we have to come to his word and to be faithful and hold each other accountable. Well, it's also really what matters is not only that the covenant's been broken, but it also matters because that's our, that's our heritage, that's our history, that we hold one another accountable. That's part of being a Methodist, is to be connected with like-minded Christians and hold each other accountable. That, that's who we are. 
Uh, that's part of our Wesleyan heritage. Uh, from the very beginning, Methodists would receive membership certificates, uh, and it later became known as membership tickets. Uh, I remember serving in the British Methodist Church, and I was so surprised that I had to give my members a ticket each year to say that they were members. Uh, and so I had to go back and read some more of the history, and, and the history goes back all the way to John Wesley, that as people would gather together for their large group gatherings called the society meetings, they would gather together, and if they were faithful in coming to those large group meetings, if they were faithful in serving God and supporting the church, then each year they would get a membership, cert a membership ticket saying, yes, you're a member of this church. And they did so to be held accountable. Part of the joy and really the blessing of this Wesleyan movement was also what's called the class meetings. These class meetings were smaller group settings. They were typically 10 to 12. They would be mixed uh, female and male, and they would come together to basically talk about how is it with your soul? How are you doing in your relationship with God? They would gather together wanting to hear from one another how it is in their relationship with God so that they could hold one another accountable, to encourage each other, to push one another, to challenge each other. And then in the Wesleyan movement, there was not only the societies with the with the uh, tickets, but not only the class meetings, but there was what's called that smallest group were the bands. And the bands were small group gatherings of typically three to seven people, all the same, all males or all females. And they would wrestle with those deep questions each week. Where have you been tempted? How did you deal with the temptation? Where were you successful and where did you fail? And as they came together weekly, they held each other accountable. They held each other accountable. And that's part of what God has called for us to do, is to hold one another accountable. And that's where we are in our denomination, that we are to hold one another accountable. And that also means we are to hold our bishop and our Episcopal leaders accountable. And if we don't, well, whether we like to admit it or not, if we don't, then we're siding with disobedience. Then we're saying that what is being done isn't really that big a deal. We're saying that really our, our rule book of what we believe and follow really doesn't matter. But I also think if we don't, and we're not being held accountable, and then we're siding with things that go against the scriptures. And we're siding with things that ultimately go against what God's best is for us. And we're leading people astray from Almighty God. One of the more powerful passages in the scriptures that often comes to mind to me during this is found in the Gospel of Matthew and in Mark. And I've chosen the Mark passage. Let me read it to you. It's Mark 942. It goes on for three or four verses, and so I invite you to read it all, but let me just read Mark 942. It says, but if you cause one of these little ones who trust in me to fall into sin, it would be better for you to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone hung around your neck. Now, Jesus, as he's teaching that, he's not teaching those who didn't believe in him. He's not teaching the Gentiles. He's not teaching his people who were not followers. He's teaching his closest followers. He's teaching his disciples. And if you read on several verses later, it gets harsher and harsher and says those who lead people to stumble lead them to sin has the dangers of hell awaiting them. This is a serious issue. And part of my role as the pastor is to reveal that and to guide you and to shepherd you and help you see that if we're teaching our children, 
our youth, those around us, something that goes against the scriptures, the word of God, it has ramifications. And we'll be held accountable to that. I know for, for me as a father of three girls, um, I know that they're going to learn a lot of things as they watch whatever they watch on TV and online. And I know just from what I hear from our teachers in our public schools in this area, they're going to hear a lot as they go to school, and they're going to learn a lot of things that I don't believe are right. But I want them to have one place at least where they can come and to truly hear the truth, to hear the Word of God and the best life that God has for them. It's that way that we can encourage them on the faith and hold them accountable. For that's what we're called to do. Uh, let me just share a couple of scriptures for you. One is found in your notes. It's Galatians chapter 6. So excuse the error there. It's Galatians 6 verses 1 and 2. Where it says, Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly Help that person back onto the right path. And be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens, and in this way obey the law of Christ. That's our call. It's not just for you in and of your own self. It's not just your faith. We are to help one another. And yes, that means praying for each other. And yes, that means encouraging each other. But it also means guiding and helping and correcting as needed. The Apostle Paul also shares this in Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. It says, Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. We are to teach one another. We're also to admonish one another. We're to behold one another accountable so that we can encourage each other to grow in our relationship with God. Or as Colossians 1.28 says, we are to work, present everyone fully mature in Christ. And that's my hope and that's my goal for you is that we can come together so that we'll all present each other fully mature in Christ. Or you can think about that Proverbs 27.17 as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. There's so much joy in that where we have discussions no matter how heated or animated they may be, but through those discussions, we grow and we deepen in our relationship with God. So to whom will you be held accountable? To whom will you be held accountable? For some, again, that makes you uh, feel uncomfortable <laughs> It gets your, what's that proverbial saying? Get your feathers uh, rustled. <laughs> but ultimately, we're going to be held accountable to God. Ultimately, each of us will be held accountable to God. Uh, Romans phrase this way, it says, So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. There will be one day we are brought before God's holy throne, and you will be held accountable to what you did to what you said and what you didn't do. For me, I want to be faithful to the Lord. I want to be faithful to how He has revealed His will and ways in the Scriptures. And I want to be faithful to that, to my dying breath, no matter whether it's pleasing and comfortable or whether the world hates it and people are very uncomfortable. I love how the Apostle Paul puts in Romans 12 too. It says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, 
and perfect will. That's what we are to pursue. That's what I want to pursue with every part of who I am is to live my life transformed, pursuing after God. Because God has called us to the best life he has for us. God has called us to live holy lives. 1 Peter 1, 14 and 15 says, As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. And that's our call as as Wesleyan Christians. That's our call, is to live our lives holy. Uh, John Wesley would say that that's that pursuit of sanctification, that we are to pursue God so earnestly, so powerfully. We're to set aside everything else that surrounds us so that we can pursue that sanctifying grace upon our lives. And as we do that, then we begin to reveal the image of God and that radiant glory of God's presence begins to draw people to Christ. And that's really my passion for us here at St. Paul, that we will be known as a people who earnestly, passionately, lovingly seek after God's presence, to live our lives fully sanctified, fully holy in everything that we do so that truly God will be glorified and honored and people will want to come and join with us. But let me finish with Jesus' prayer. This comes from Jesus' high priestly prayer in the Gospel of John, where Jesus, he, he's about to be arrested. He's about to go to the cross, and yet what he does is he prays for his disciples. And I think in this prayer, we can hear that prayer for us as well, where Jesus prays. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. They do not belong to this world any more than I do. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. Just as you sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world. And I give myself as a holy sacrifice for them so they can be made holy by your truth. So will you be held accountable? Will you come and join us in holding one another accountable in our pursuit of God so that truly we will be made holy? Let's pray together. Almighty God, we come to you for you are most holy, most loving, most gracious. You know everything about our lives. You know our good and our bad, our failings and our successes. And you invite us in the name of Jesus to come to you. And so, Almighty God, most gracious Father, help us to set aside all that entraps us. Help us to know the lies of this world and to hold on to your truth that you have revealed to us in your holy word. Help us to be faithful to you, Lord Jesus. And I pray that in the power of your spirit, in the power of your name, your sanctifying grace will be poured upon us to transform our lives into your presence. Hear our prayers and be glorified today. We also pray for the needs of our church, our congregation, the people of St. Paul. We lift up to you Rick Kennedy as he grieves the morning, as he grieves the passing of his mother, and ask for your grace and your comfort. 
We pray for many of our older members. We lift up to you Mary Margaret and HV and Linda and Mary Lynn and, and others. And ask that in the name of Jesus, you'll grant them comfort and healing and strength. And we do pray for us, the people of St. Paul, that as we continue to discern your will, you will speak truth to our hearts. Lead us and guide us so that we will come together in being the holy people you've called us to be. Hear our prayers as we unite our hearts together in praying our Lord's Prayer. And pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, I invite you to stand as you're able, and let's join together in singing our song of commitment. It's Take Time to Be Holy, number 395. Uh, thank you again for worshiping with us, uh, whether that is here in person or online. We're glad that uh, you've chosen to worship with us and pray that you have a great week. Uh, for those of you who are worshiping in person, we do have the Sacrament of Holy Communion that's available for you in our Grace Chapel. And so immediately following the service, you're invited to step over to the chapel to receive the Blessed Sacrament. Uh, there will be an informational meeting about our discernment process and where we are in that process 
uh, shortly following today's service. So if you'd like to attend that, please just stay in place. And then let me remind you that our third listening session is coming up on July 31st. And so please come back for that meeting on July 31st. But receive now this benediction and this blessing as we leave here today. May God truly bless you. May he send you forth out into the world to be a person of peace for him. Go in the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.